Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, HVAC Hospitals and Healthcare Facilities, sponsored by Aegis Bearing Protection Rings. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. Here are some tips for today's webcast. If you're having trouble with your slides or your audio, refresh your browser or click Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo, or you can control the volume settings of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer speakers. If you're having technical problems, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box, and someone will respond as soon as possible in the Answered Question box. Type questions for today's speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The Q&A portion will start after the prepared presentation in about 45 minutes. And if you're on Twitter, tweet your questions to us at hashtag CSEHospitalHVAC. Today's webcast is being recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to the archive in about a week. To download the presentation slides use event resources on the left side of your screen. For those of you who are interested in receiving an AIA CES approved learning unit and one HSW credit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your um, AIA CES certificate, use the Learning Unit Exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window, then you can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the on-demand version of the webcast. Now, in keeping with American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System Policy, please take a few moments to read the quality assurance slide. Here is a list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. And now the rest of the learning objectives that we'll cover the, in today's uh, presentation. And now, we'll hear from today's sponsor. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for various browser speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. By allowing motors to operate at less than full speed, VFDs can save 30% or more in energy costs. But VFDs can also damage motor bearings. Without shaft grounding, VFD-induced voltages can discharge through motor bearings causing damage such as pitting, frosting, and fluting, and unplanned motor failure in as little as three months. Revolutionary new Aegis bearing protection rings provide proven long-term protection against VFD-induced bearing damage. By channeling harmful shaft currents away from bearings and safely to ground, Aegis rings ensure that motors last for the L10 life of their bearings. To protect motors from bearing damage, prevent process downtime, and secure VFD energy savings, specify Aegis rings. Now let's meet today's presenters, Gregory Quinn and J. Patrick Bonza. Patrick Bonza is Senior Mechanical Engineer at Smith Seckman Reed in Houston. He has more than 35 years in the consulting engineering field with the last 30 years in healthcare design and engineering. He's responsible for HVAC, plumbing, 
in fire protection design for hospital and healthcare projects, and he's currently a technical resource leader for the plumbing and mechanical disciplines. He has authored several articles on smoke control and related codes and standards and has spoken at the ASHE PDC Summit and at Build Boston. He is a past member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Gregory Quinn is Principal and Healthcare Market Leader for Affiliated Engineers, Inc. in Madison, Wisconsin. He has, in his 20 years with AEI, Quinn has developed, helped to deliver more than 16 million square feet of world-class healthcare and research facility space. Uh, elevated to principal early in his career, Quinn is AEI's National Healthcare Practice Team Leader. With expertise in environmental control, electrical capacity, reliability, and security, he has led landmark projects for the National Institutes of Health, University of Chicago Medicine, and Houston Methodist Hospital System, and he was a 2008 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner, and he is a current member of the CSE Editorial Advisory Board. Thank you, Greg and Pat, for joining us today. And Greg, you are our first speaker, and the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Jack. And I wanted to reflect a bit on the first learning objective to launch into a conversation about applicable codes, codes and standards in hospitals and healthcare facilities from an HVAC perspective. There are several that are quite applicable that are generalist in nature, NFPA 101, Life Safety Code, NFPA 90A, which is an installation of HVAC systems guide, as well as NFPA 99, which is a facilities healthcare code. Most applicable, though, are two standards that we'll focus on in the talk that Pat and I will be delivering today. The first is shown on your screen right now, ASHRAE Standard 62.1, which is ventilation criteria for occupied spaces, and as a tool helps designers understand the amount of fresh air required to meet expectations for human comfort, ventilation needs, and general occupancy in spaces like a healthcare facility. It tends to be nonspecific to the facility type, but is certainly an influencer on the overall outcome of our facilities. The Facilities Guidelines Institute publishes an article that helps planners and designers and to some extent builders understand expectations of modern healthcare facilities. A representation of the 2014 edition is shown on the left in the blue as you look. In it are specific criterion by which designers use to measure volumes of air, filtration requirements of air, air changes, humidification requirements, and so on. These are technical elements that are informed by a standard that ASHRAE publishes, standard 170. This is the guidebook for HVAC designers for healthcare facilities. You see a small expert excerpt of that at the right. We'll be focusing primarily our talk on expectation criteria that's largely driven by information in this standard. In general, though, the FGI guidelines adoption nationally is shown like this, with various editions applicable to states. And it varies, so as designers apply new criteria to new facilities, depending upon the, the classification of the healthcare building, it's important to recognize where you are and what has been adopted. In addition to that, well, just a few excerpts of what we'll be talking about re regarding ASHRAE Standard 170. Simple tables that define on the left-hand side various spaces within the facility, and then expectations for filter requirements. So this is one table that uses a guide. 
another table might help us understand specifically where outlets and inlets are in the spaces, depending upon what type of spaces they are. ASHRAE 170 helps us with that. It also helps us understand how many air changes, both from the direct outdoor or within the space itself, is required. Here are some examples of surgical spaces on this sampling of the uh, table. We'll talk more in depth about this later on in the presentation. But it's important to recognize that understanding where you are geographically is very important. There are states that have not adopted FGI as a guideline, so it's important to recognize what those are. A few examples are here, state of Illinois, state of California, state of Texas. In, in turn, have these states have published their own articles of expectation, guidelines, standards, and code for ventilation in healthcare facilities. Many of those are adaptations of FGI and ASHRAE 170, but the bottom line is it's very important to understand where the facility is and then further what standards and codes are applicable. The last element that I wanted to introduce and explain a little bit further today regarding codes and standards for healthcare and how they're applicable to HVAC systems is NFPA 99. NFPA 99 is a guideline that helps us understand the criticality of the, of the facility with respect to the nature of healthcare being delivered in it as well as where the facility sits and its various risks that are imposed. So a Category 1 facility expects that systems are to be operable regardless of what happens to support space, patient needs. A very reliable type of facility, a very reliable consequently type of system. Category 4 is the other end of the spectrum, whereas such systems, should they fail, will have no impact on patient care. So thus the investment in those mechanical and HVAC systems don't need to be as mindful of reliability investments. So NFPA 99 helps us understand and helps us We also shared as a learning objective for this presentation understanding of hospital acquired infections or HAIs and consequently indoor air quality what's important and how are we mindful of it as designers and planners. The reality of hospital acquired infections is very, very real and the impacts in the industry are great. Estimations as to the amounts of and types of infections that are acquired within facilities where people are admitted to in fact become better are significant, and this is a simple summary that Pat will speak to in more detail in a moment. But the challenge is great, and as designers, as we understand how we invest in systems to help, to the extent possible, prevent the transmission of infections to a, a, an ill patient, to a, to a well one, is very important. Just a few statistics that you all can obtain on your own if you like, but are important to, to understand the magnitude of the issue. You can read these on your own. And of course, the bottom line is significant of the cost of health of hospital acquired infections to the healthcare industry. Part of an introduction to the chain of events that happens as how infections are transmitted can be drawn directly from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. The image on the right explains rather technically, but in a simple image, the chain of events that happens. But as they're aff affected by HVAC systems, there's a few things that need to occur in a certain order for an infection to be transmitted. A susceptible host or patient that's vulnerable, an immunocompromised patient is a term that's used, a whole pathway by which an infection can transmit itself, item two. Items three and four are regarding the volume of the infection as well as the intensity of the infection. And then volume five is the mode of transmission. Is it airborne? Is it surface contact? Is it fluid? And so on. 
So as designers, particularly of HVAC systems, having mindfulness of these elements is very important. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, this is Pat Bonza, and uh, we're ready to go on uh, uh, the next slide here. Hospital-acquired infections, they were also called nosocomial infections at one time, and then the CDC uh, decided to, uh, to change that. But as Greg was talking about, uh, the uh, infections that people get while receiving something for uh, another condition occur in, in many areas. There are significant causes of illness and death. The CDC has done studies for a long time, and uh, which has spilled over into uh, the Centers for uh, the CMS, CM, Centers for Medicaid uh, and Medicare, regarding trying to keep hospital costs down. But they estimate five to ten percent of all hospitalizations patients will get them in some form or fashion, and from a variety of things, from breathing to uh, surgical site infections and other things, which lead to billions of dollars in, in health care costs. And they don't have to be in a hospital. They can be in a long-term care facility, outpatient surgery, uh, in-stage renal uh, facilities, any ambulatory care section. And all of that makes a difference to us as HVAC designers because while we think of one of them may be less critical than the other, everything is critical for what we do in trying to protect patients, protect staff and visitors and everybody else in our in our designs. Some of the, the numbers uh, from, again, five or six years ago put together by the CDC, you can see that pneumonia and surgical site infections uh, by far are the largest uh, that uh, uh, hospital-acquired uh, infections have come around. There are also bloodstream infections, which are primarily from either catheters or uh, something similar, similar to that. So overall, the numbers are huge. But one of the things that has helped bring down some of those numbers, and you can see the BSI or the bloodstream infections or surgical site infections, as well as invasive uh, methicillin-resistant strains, uh, staph infections, which was another general term that was used, they're, they're starting to come down. And those numbers, are uh, the percentages, are not really from the overall uh, gross numbers. They're from the target numbers of what they were trying to reduce. So they are making progress. And you can ask yourself, why is that? And so, well, a lot of it, I think, is from uh, staff and patient, patient education, but it's also, uh, on our part, more diligent HVAC design and maintenance from the facility manager standpoint. HAIs, again, we're talking about those all day long. And what do they do? They cause disease and illness. They can be viral viruses, bacteria, fungal pathogens. They can be uh, either airborne or uh, something that you come in contact with. But the overall uh, definition, if you want to call it that, is that an inf it's an infection contracted from the environment or the staff of any healthcare facility. And the environment could be, again, anything from uh, stuff that has been in contact with the uh, uh, anything in a patient room, anything in a procedure room, or anything that is uh, floating around in the air. So what is the relationship between HVAC and all of these HAIs? Well, HVAC system obviously uh, provides air. It regulates thermal uh, environment, the temperature and relative humidity. It tries to control uh, chemical sensitivities to uh, things like Cytex, which is a, a cold sterilant or formaldehyde, or anything else that people might have sensitivities to. So how, how does all that relate, especially when you're trying to keep people comfortable? Well, before we can keep people comfortable, we have to think about 
what is in the unit. If the filters are contaminated, especially to the point where they start to break down, all of the uh, things we're trying to filter out could be spread into the airstream, and generally they're so small that you're not going to be able to see them. Drain pans under cooling coils that don't drain properly, or co or coils that have uh, that are plugged up or have moisture and mold growth on them, or possible even improperly working humidifiers or portable water contamination. Again, humidifiers are not used all the time, and the potential is there for uh, dead legs and Legionella growth that you don't uh, want to put into airstreams. So how do you mitigate all that? Well, some of the obvious things are clean filters, correct efficiencies, and when they uh, do get replaced, that there aren't any air gaps between them. Because uh, if you say, I only need six of them and I put in five, you haven't done anything. You want to make sure that there's no moisture carryover. But also, you need to humidify properly to avoid any condensation or having it so dry that occupants start to get dehydrated. But some of the most uh, important aspects of an HVAC system are the ventilation and pressurization, making sure that the airflow patterns are correct, both in rooms as well as in buildings or between rooms and adjacent spaces, which is the pressurization. You want go always go from the clean to less clean uh, spaces. You also want to avoid infiltration. We don't generally um, air condition or uh, exhaust or anything else a vertical shaft because it's surrounded. But if there are holes in the top and bottom of a shaft, we may get unwanted unfiltered, untreated air into the space, which we need to be very cognizant of. So how does the CDC fit into all this? Well, the CDC has guidelines for all buildings, not just healthcare facilities, but it primarily focuses on filtration and air cleaning because they're looking at the particle type, size, maintenance considerations, as well as economic considerations. They know they can't just force you to do everything uh, to the nth degree, but you do have to, to uh, make sure that things are done well, done correctly, that you maintain it, and that you're trapping the things the particles that you want when you need to do them. They use terms called in indoor environmental quality. While we're talking about indoor air quality, they're talking about the entire environment. They want to see how the HVAC system is managed. They want to see that the ventilation system is designed correctly, that carbon dioxide concentrations, which include outdoor and indoor air, uh, com combinations are done correctly. They talk about the outdoor air quality. Is it good enough to actually put into your building or, or do you need to do something different? They have even gone so far as to create a CDC checklist, HVAC checklist, which has, I think it's about 12 or 15 pages long that starts at the uh, outdoor air, goes through the equipment, all the way to the indoor space and then how you remove it with very detailed questions that you need to look at if you want to uh, try to isolate and identify problems. They've even partnered with the uh, Department of Agriculture, particularly on infectious biological agents. These could be anything from West Nile virus, yellow fever, tuberculosis, Anything that could be classified as a biosafety level three hazard. They identify air change requirements, filtration, what needs to be in, uh, uh, performed in biological safety cabinets, but they specifically require verification and documentation that you're following these procedures. Back to you, Greg. So 
today's industry continues to rely on empirical and historical data and storylines to inform the criteria by which we use as designers and planners of healthcare facilities. There is a growing number of resources available, however, that begin to look more specifically at the science of transmission and understanding the applicability of HVAC to do a better job. And the CDC is one of those, as Pat pointed out. But the bottom line is 100% cleanliness is next to impossible. It's important to recognize the many, many variables that would need to be managed for that to be the case. So what Pat and I would like to do is to talk about strategies for improvement and put applicability to, this, to the themes, to the specific data that's shown in, in the statistical information that is uh, associated with hospital-acquired infection and share a bit about how to translate that into solutions. And we're going to talk about strategies for improvement on five levels. The first is related to dilution, notably air changes. The second is related to the connection of molecular particles and, and the transmission of pathogens given various states of temperature and humidity. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about filtration requirements and effectiveness of filtering on various bacteria, virus, and fungal uh, pathogens. We'll talk about room pressurization and the controls thereof with a, a sample or two of spaces as to how they're described from a pressure differential standpoint. And then we'll also introduce, at least into this presentation, a conversation about UVGI, or ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, and its effectiveness in helping to lessen or mitigate infection transmission. So for starters, dilution, I had mentioned a moment ago that empirical data continues to dominate how our criteria and standards and guidelines and ultimately adopted by codes read. But this empirical data is in, in, important in a, and it, it continues to inform guidelines and it's largely measured in terms of full space air changes. Those full space air changes are filtered to a certain extent depending upon the criticality of the space and are also injected by various percentages of outdoor air depending upon how ASHRAE standard, ASHRAE standard 62 applies. A, a tool that is a mainstay now, 10 years ago it was very much emerging, but is a mainstay now in uh, critical care hospital HVAC design is computative fluid dynamics in using tools to help us understand the predictability of air flow, air temperature, and ultimately air change within specific spaces. So the little image in the bottom right-hand corner there reflects a cross-section of an OR environment and how air flows through it at various temperatures. It helps inform device placement. It helps us understand displacement of air, how long a particulate of air will stay within a space, and helps us balance comfort and infection prevention at the same time. And in the end, helps us write design, write install, and then ultimately rightly operate our ventilation systems. This is a, a bit more of a reflection of a typical OR environment and the ins and outs of that environment as it relates to HVAC systems. Uh, criteria and standards tell us that operating rooms need to be managed to a minimum threshold of air change. It also helps guide us in positioning of air diffusion as well as extraction from the space. I'll pause on that for a minute. You can see above the patient lying on the table, blue arrows that reflect what's typically referred to as laminar flows or non-aspirating diffuser, diffusers over the top of the patient that ultimately attempts to have a unidirectional airflow pattern from high to low within the space. Empirical data and growingly research data suggest that this is an ideal case for us to manage the and minimize 
the infection transmission pr pr uh, potential within an OR environment. ORs are typically positively pressurized, almost exclusively positively pressurized, and filtered uh, greatly, and we'll talk about that in a moment. They're also an environment that needs to be managed both in temperature and humidity levels as well, and we'll further talk about that um, downstream here a little bit. Here's another example, a cartoon example of what would often be representative of a waiting room, um, an emergency department waiting room, where the importance of understanding effective air transfer within the space is, is um, significant. Uh, this is often a place where there's many undiagnosed patients intermixed with well patients, and as such, the spaces are expected to be exhausted entirely and sourced by 100% fresh air. The cartoon image that popped up here reflects one means of how we can help predict air transfer and air temperature within a, within an emergency department waiting space, and it becomes even more important as the geometry of these emergency department waiting spaces become unique. And positioning of diffusers and positioning of exhaust grills are quite important. ASHRAE standard 170 helps us understand this idea and expectation of air change rates, and I've highlighted on the left-hand side, the various types of spaces, uh, types of space within a healthcare facility, as well as the minimum outdoor and total air change rates required. So these are used as guidelines, standards, and then ultimately adopted by codes expected in healthcare facilities today. Our second subject, our second strategy for improvement is temperature and humidity control. And similar to the statistics and the research as, public, as published by the Center for Disease Control, temperature and relative humidity are growingly uh, more uh, informative as to how we understand and can maintain optimum conditions for uh, preventing infection transmission. And you can see Dr. Farhad numbers um, quote here. There's also a host of data that you too can research about the, ver the applicability of temperature and humidity control in the transmission of bacteria, virus, and fungal pathogens within a space. I think what's important to recognize is a host of impactors as it relates to temperature and humidity in healthcare spaces. Uh, given the season of the year, the type of space or the selective area, uh, the expectation of code, relative humidities tend to have a more ideal situation as it relates to transmission of various droplets. Uh, the, the elevated humidities tend to allow for droplets of pathogen or virus to drop out of the airstream quicker than does drier environments, as well as the patient themselves. Mucous membranes are much more susceptible to infection if they're drier, so therefore hu humidity in drier spaces helps improve infection transmission rates. The graphic to the right represents this a bit as well. You'll notice the measurable drop in infection transmission as relative humidity in spaces moves from 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so that's an that's a important statistic for us to understand and how it's applied to our solutions and how it's operated in our healthcare facilities. Similarly to the air change conversation, ASHRAE standard 170 helps us understand the expectation for variability of relative humidity and temperature in a host of spaces applicable to healthcare. And I've highlighted a few of those, uh, but it's important to recognize that this is um, helpful to, for sizing criteria and for operating characteristics within healthcare spaces. Pat? 
Yes, sir. Uh, talking about indoor air relative humidity, uh, pollutants, and ASHRAE 62.1, I think one of the important things to identify is why is there an ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation criteria? And what I've found is that its statement of purpose, which is to provide the correct ventilation for proper indoor air quality, which is acceptable to human occupants, and that word acceptable is always subjective, but we're going to talk about that in just a little bit more. But recent studies also have found that indoor air relative humidity, as, as Greg had mentioned, uh, have a significant impact on occupant comfort, but also in their ability to either fight off or ward off or perhaps become infected with things that are in the air, which could be anything from uh, uh, pollutants caused by furniture, outdoor air, uh, improper exhaust, or any of those criteria. And we talked about the codes, and you wonder, and you may want to ask yourself, is, is are they really that important? They are very important. Otherwise, m many of these codes would have not ever been written to address these uh, both air change rates, temperatures, air, uh, relative humidities, or anything else. But there was another uh, uh, criteria that uh, was identified by several ASHRAE members, and it was called the Schofield Sterling Diagram. It was published back in 1985, which is still valid today, though, that shows optimal relative humidity levels. Uh, for proper occupant health, and they addressed bacteria, viruses, mold, uh, allergies, and things like that. And what they found was the optimum range that minimized any of the infections or uh, illnesses was between 40 and 60 percent. Another study by uh, Simon Lax on similar things studied specifically 10 patient rooms and hospitals for almost a year. And they also found the same thing. Hospital-acquired infections were the lowest when relative humidities were above 40%, below 60. But when the relative humidity started to drop and air started to dry out, they found that the HAIs uh, more than doubled. Greg? Item number three, as Pat and I talk through strategies for improvement is optimization of filtration levels in healthcare facilities. And the graphic on the left represents a whole host of fungal pathogens, bacteria, and virus. And the molecule size of those particles as it relates to the filtering expectation of various performance types, be it MERV, which is the minimum efficiency reporting value as published by um, ASHRAE. And I, I guess it's a little challenging to read, but I think it's important to recognize that two, two things on this. Uh, one is a, a common virus uh, this time of year, influenza, which kind of rides about the center of the virus category there. And also what's important to recognize is the, uh, if the relative effectiveness of MERV-15, which traditionally in uh, ninety five percent effective ASHRAE filter captures almost all of these, and HEPA filtration does as well as one would expect. So recognizing the optimization of filtering with the air change rates, the temperature and humidity levels is the uh, criteria by which designers look to and then operators ultimately manage to for effectiveness of um, minimizing HAIs. Minimum filter efficiencies for various spaces is identified in this chart. This is um, an, an extraction from, uh, I believe this is ASHRAE standard 62. Uh, but again, we have standards that help us understand starting points for this. This isn't the final solution in all cases, but it's definitely a starting point by which we can understand the criticality of the patient, the expectation of the, of the room performance, and then ultimately what the expectation of the filtered airstream should be. Yep. We talked about uh, what is acceptable. Well, def the definition that has uh, been around for a while and then you can find in codes is that what is acceptable in terms of air quality is air in which there are no known contaminants 
at any harmful concentrations as determined by cognizant authorities or people in the know at which a sta substantial ma majority of people exposed do not express dissatisfaction. And it's kind of like when they when you uh, have a new road and you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the speed limit should it be? They generally measure that and knock out the top and the bottom, and what most people drive, that's a good one. It's kind of the same thing that uh, was used here. So everything we've been talking about have been pathogens in general, but primarily airborne pathogens, the stuff we breathe, the stuff we're most exposed to. and they could be viral, it could be bacteria, they could be uh, uh, fungal, and introduced in the air in any uh, any form, such as coughing, sneezing, uh, shaking bed linens, uh, anything that's been trapped that you can put back into the air. And according to the CDC, in their studies, as you can see from the chart, uh, and have some time to study it, the larger the particle is, the shorter the travel time it is uh, to go and whether that falls or travels horizontally. But the, the smaller the particle, such as viruses and spores and, and things like that, the longer it's going to stay suspended. Anywhere, again, from six seconds up to many hours. How are they spread? Obviously by turbulent airflow contact with surfaces, uh, higher humidities can in cause them to fall out and be attached to things where drier air can uh, identify that the uh, uh, particles will shrink in size and therefore stay in suspension longer. The uh, size anywhere from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 to 100 microns. Again, size makes a difference when we're talking about aerosols. Greg? Our fourth strategy, thank you, our, our fourth strategy for improvement uh, deals with uh, a conversation about room pressurization and pressurization differentials uh, uh, against adjacent uh, spaces. And I'd like to pause a little bit on this cartoon. This is a generalized diagram of an airborne infectious isolation patient room where we describe uh, the expectation of this room performance. An airborne infectious isolation room typically meets qualifications for air change requirements, of which were guided by empirical data published in ASHRAE 170. It also expects designers and builders to understand position of diffusers and extractors or, or exhaust grills, and you can see the low wall condition behind the bed on either side expectation that we have, to the extent possible, unidirectional airflow within this patient room. The room itself, where the bed is located, is negative with respect to either one of its adjacencies. On the right-hand side, you'll see the toilet room, which is more negative than the patient room. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see an ante room, which again is more negative than the patient room. So in itself, the space is maintained at a constant volume, a constant air change rate, at prescribed temperature, humidification, and filtering requirements in order to meet a threshold of room pressure differential. The CDC helps us understand criteria and both design and construction criteria related to how we apply strategy um, for designing these spaces. And this is a simple chart published by the CDC guidelines to help us with this. ASHRAE 170, more specifically about whether a, a clinical space is positive, negative, or neutral. Again, in Table 7.1, it helps us understand this based on the clinical space type on the left-hand side, and then the very first column at the right, whether it's intended to be positive, negative, or neutral to the uh, surrounding spaces. Yeah? Yeah. In all of the everything we're talking about, uh, the, there's a there's a term that uh, uh, the CDC and other people use when trying to develop protocols for how to treat uh, and uh, uh, protect staff and patients. It's called engineering controls, and it doesn't mean just the control of uh, a, uh, a thermostat or a cooling coil valve or anything like that, but it's controls on effective ways to control airflow, minimize pollutants, and airborne pathogens. 
so what's incumbent upon the designers is obviously the airflow patterns, where do you place diffusers, what type of diffusers to use, what type of uh, uh, filtration to use. But you have to know what it is you're dealing with to start with. You can't just say, well, the code tells me to put a 90% or a MER 14 filter in. It's like, but what am I really dealing with? How are they going to use that space? So that's one of the things that is truly important in our business. Greg? Our fifth strategy for improvement deals with the subject of UVGI and its effectiveness at mitigating infection transmission. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this on, on two levels. Uh, the first level, I simply will speak to this chart, which is recent data that's published through a study of infection transmission both before and after installation of UG, UVGI. So these are infrared lights that would be mounted in a space. This particular study looked at upper room mounting and its effectiveness at reducing transmission of various uh, infections, be it respiratory or influenza or tuberculosis, over a certain patient population and its effectiveness thereof. And it's pretty measurable when it comes to it. This information and this, this statistical data is growing. Um, it's inconclusive at the point of being mandated within how we approach design for new facilities. But I think it's important to recognize that there's a growing trend towards an application of UVGI in a still environment for helping improve patient outcomes and minimizing infection transmissions. UVGI had early genesis in HVAC design as it related to can we, can we mitigate infection transmission at the air handler or within the airstream as opposed to in a still environment or a more still environment. And the challenge with that and, and a common solution was one that's depicted in this cartoon here is installation of ultraviolet lights within uh, the air handler itself. The challenge here is residence time and effectiveness of the lights to actually be effective on an airstream that runs at a certain pace, often at the 400 feet per minute range, which is pretty typical for an air handler. Um, however, that's not necessarily uh, eliminating its need or its desire or its growing trend in air handling, and we're finding that it's effective at keeping um, air handlers and uh, in particular, wet functions of air handlers clean over time, and it's a common protocol to install ultraviolet lights downstream of cooling coils to keep the wet side of the cooling coil um, cleaner over longer periods of time. Pat? So when we talk about HVAC systems, we're going to, I'm going to try to summarize some of the things that we've been uh, talking about is obviously uh, filtration. When you, for uh, collection of particles, bacteria, viruses, and anything that, that's going to be in the airstream, whether it originates in the room or it's something that could be generated uh, through the equipment, the proper ventilation rates, uh, equipment needs to be cleanable. We need to meet the comfort, relative humidity, and IAQ as well as IEQ standards. And we do that through proper air distribution and placement and collection uh, in order to protect people. So the best ways to do that is know your user. Have conversations with physicians, infection control professionals, facility managers. Make sure everybody's on board and everybody's aware of what your design decisions are. Know how that room is going to be used or potentially how it could be used, which will help identify what type of filtration, what efficiencies and MERV ratings need to be used in order to do that, or if the space should be exhausted. Even though code may not tell you to, you need to have those conversations in order to make that work. Thank you, Greg and Pat, for the first-rate presentation. Now our presenters will answer questions about the topic and type questions in the Ask a Question box on your screen. Please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing their name before the question. And if you are on Twitter, tweet your questions to hashtag CSE Hospital HVAC. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Information will be posted on 
line at www.csemag.com with the archive version of the webcast and to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES approved learning unit and HSW credit, um, credit certificate use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The ex exam will open in a new browser window and you can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the CSE website at www.csemag.com with the on-demand version. Okay, now we'll take your questions. So let's start with, with Pat. Your first question is, what differential pressure sensor, sensors are most accurate and reliable to ensure that room pressure, pressurization is correctly monitored? Um, that's a, an excellent question and one that uh, comes up a lot. Uh, what types are the ones that, act, that, that uh, obviously are fairly accurate? Okay, the uh, uh, measuring between a quarter in an isolation patient room, for example, or between a quarter and an operating room, uh, they need to be uh, uh, positioned correctly. They need to have some sensitivity to read to at least a hundredth or a thousandth of a, of a uh, 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 measurement in order to uh, to make that work. And uh, more than anything, it's placement, but it's controls of the air systems that will make those things work best. Okay, thank you, and Greg, let's um, get to your first question. Is computational fluid dynamics software accurate in helping engineering firms properly designing HVAC airflow systems for hospitals? Computative fluid dynamics um, is a tool that uh, helps us in two regards. I'm going to look to a slide here that I spoke to earlier about that. Um, it doesn't necessarily impact the expectation for air change, either from the outdoors or filtered air changes, but what it does do is it helps us greatly in understanding positions of diffusers within a space, so where air actually enters the space and how it's extracted from it, such that we can manage the breathing zones to the best predictable uh, value that we can. And the image that I'm sharing with you on the screen right now, if you're still watching, reflects an emergency department waiting room. This, this happens to be for a children's hospital. So two things CFD helped us with here. Number one, positioning of supply and exhaust grills. But number two, maintaining an ideal breathing zone for a children's environment where that breathing zone is lower than it typically would be in a general hospital. So we wanted to pay particular attention to that and being able to model that digitally before we ultimately designed and built it was very important. Okay, Pat, your next question is, um, have there been any known cases where higher relative, relative humidity levels have resulted in uh, condensation issues? I have seen condensation issues uh, where uh, rooms, particularly operating rooms, uh, have had condensation on the walls when the temperature had to change rather dramatically uh, because of the type of procedure. So the knowing what the procedure is, the length of time, and how quick that room needs to change uh, temperatures. If it was, for example, a burn unit that was in needed to go to uh, 85 to 90 degrees and then drop back to 68 degrees and things like that, the, the potential is there for uh, condensation if you don't watch the dew point of the air temperature being supplied. So there are that has occurred. Uh, it's also occurred when. Uh, systems were sh actually shut down instead of just monitored back and trying to restart uh, early, uh, for example, early in the morning. Um, 
that uh, the relative humidity overnight had uh, had risen to the point where uh, putting 50 degree or colder air into a room caused condensation because the relative humidity were so high. Okay, Greg, let's get on to your next question. And uh, that is, could you address the impact of laminar operating room design regarding filtration? Uh, okay. That's a good question and a frequent one. I'm flipping back and highlighting a slide that might help me in answering that question or addressing that comment as, as it's currently stated. So um, the expectation for air quality from a filtered standpoint within an OR tends to be no less than a MERV 15 or a 95% ASHRAE situation often and growingly more common or HEPA filtered uh, air quality within the space. It's further expected that an OR will see no less than 15 air changes more frequently, 20 air changes. And how we deliver the air to the space is often referred to as a non-aspirating diffusion or laminar flow diffusion situation. So the expectation then would be that the space performs in a unidirectional manner. So predictability of the air path is from top to bottom and extracted near the bottom so that we see once through air transfer over the operated patient. The, the correlation between laminar flow and filtration, uh, they tend to be on independent paths, but the expectation to meet requirements for both is very important in an OR setting. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question, but uh, we'll cheat and make it a two-part question. And Pat, this one goes to you. Uh, what type of air handling unit air filtration is best for different hospital environments? And part two is, what is the best waste air filtration disposal techniques for the O&M team in order to protect workers? Well, you're right. That is a uh, that's a loaded question, but it all deals <laughs> with. with <laughs> it was a very good one. It all deals with filtration, though, and and what type is best uh, truly depends upon what is the space being served. Uh, to arbitrarily say that I need to put HEPA filters uh, in in all my units because they might serve a an extremely sensitive space may or may not be the best answer. If they're serving only operating rooms or a uh, uh, immune depressed uh, patient area, that's probably the right answer. And you may want them also at the point of air delivery into the room, not just in the air handler. But if you're talking an outpatient uh, waiting area or uh, something else, uh, a 90% uh, type filter or a MERV 14 might be adequate. But as far as removing air, uh, as, as Greg was talking about from an emergency uh, department uh, waiting area, which is required to be exhausted, uh, if you can't just throw it away through uh, uh, through the roof, away from any uh, potential uh, 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 re-entrainment or contaminant source or having workers accidentally walk up on it, uh, having tall exhaust stacks is one thing, but when you can't do that bag-in, bag-out type filtration that will not expose uh, any worker to a uh, uh, to any of the contaminants that might be trapped in the filters might be the best way to go. Thank you for those great answers, and thanks to the great speakers, Gregory Quinn, and Patrick Bonza for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Aegis Bearing Protection Rings, for supporting today's webcast. And now that we're just about done, we want your feedback. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media, thanks for attending this webcast. This now concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.